Uh, please rise for our glorious leader. Hello. Hello. I stand before you injured in body, spirit, and pride. But through the power of the cinema and the love of the church, I persevere. The work continues. We are united in a common cause. Perhaps it is fate that this day in the middle of January, we're once again fighting for our freedoms. Not the freedom from tyranny, persecution, or oppression, but from movies that suck. We are united that we want to love bad movies and deny guilty pleasures. And should we win the day, perhaps this day in the middle of January, was a day that the world cried out in one voice, we will not go silently into the night. We will not vanish without a fight. We're going to move on. We're going to survive. For today, we celebrate Sucker Punch. Out of the gate, I'm going to address some valued feedback that this needs more jokes, and I need to modulate my voice more, as monotone is my default speaking voice. It is clear, also, that this is a script, and so I will be completely improvising this episode. This month's object of worship mistakes weaponization for empowerment, and John Hamm picks a nose! I unironically love this movie, and I'm going to make you love it, too! This is Sucker Punch! Sucker Punch is a 2011 release from Zack Snyder, the much maligned director of part of Justice League. All of the murder of Batman and the murder of Superman and Dawn of the Dead. That last one, appropriate given his career. Ba boom! Nope, not gonna do that. Opening with a proscenium not unlike the beginning of Superman the movie, it establishes visually that the film is a fantasy and lowers the bar of verisimilitude gives the audience permission to suspend their disbelief early on and allows Snyder to stylize his heart out. Sucker Punch is a simple story told in a complicated way. Set in an ambiguous time frame around the 1960s, Emily Browning's baby doll is a 17-year-old who, after the sudden death of her mother, is left with only her younger sister and her rapey drunk stepfather. Bursting with rage that the estate has been left entirely to the daughters, he attacks first baby doll and then the younger sister. This culminates in an armed baby doll attempting to shoot the stepfather only to kill her sister. Police are called in and he has baby doll committed to a mental institution while the crime is investigated. He then pays a bribe to have her lobotomized during her stay to ensure she can't testify against him. This film sets a clock right up front. She has five days to escape. Now, here's the other thing. I don't have a doctor on staff who does lobotomies. What? But there just happens to be one scheduled to come in. He'll be here in five days. Sucker Punch is about the moment between life and death, consciousness and unconsciousness, fantasy and reality. It is a two-hour glimpse into a heartbeat of time. Not unlike 2010's Inception, Sucker Punch has a multi-layered reality. The institution is the real world where time is short, help is scant, and the entire film is told in a short montage. The second layer is that of a brothel slash club where all of the women inmates are now prostitutes. The veil between these two layers is often thin with only slight set changes, color differences, and costuming separating the two. The third layer is a complete fantasy where Baby Doll retreats to sublimate the fear and helplessness she feels in the real world by becoming a scantily clad badass. The justification for the fantasies come from the establishing shot of the institution's gymnasium, where stage dominates the room. It is intimated that all the women inmates go through immersion therapy by acting out their traumas on stage. What you're imagining right now, that world you control, that place can be as real as any pain. Carlo Gugino gives a delightfully over-the-top performance through a thick accent as the woman's therapist in the real world and their dance instructor in the club. 
unlike Inception, which relies solely on exposition. That's why the military developed dream sharing. It was a training program for soldiers to shoot and stab and strangle each other and then wake up. In visual metaphor and time dilation to separate its realities, Sucker Punch leans heavily on color palette and costuming to separate the first two layers, with the third becoming an abstract CG construct of balletic violence and batshit crazy. Sucker Punch is a visual tour de force that is a testament to Snyder's unnerving and unswerving ability to convey emotion and narrative through imagery. This is one of the things I absolutely adore about this movie. The wordless five minute opening sequence is what gave me hope for his version of Superman, who turned out to be a murdering mope. One of the most prevalent criticisms of Sucker Punch is the unrelenting use of pop music, making it essentially a long form music video. This is valid. Sucker Punch is a music video. Snyder has misappropriately used music cues in most of his films. Leaning on the emotional resonance of the song to bolster the scene. Sucker Punch stands out as songs overlay each of the fantasy sequences in the third layer, with Bjork's Army of Me even used diegetically in the second layer, which propels Baby Doll's first fantasy. Once again, Sucker Punch is a music video. This is reinforced in a deleted musical section where a fully committed future Poe Dameron, Oscar Isaacs, plays Blue, a singing, dancing pimp who can't understand why no one likes him. Blue in reality is the chief orderly who has taken the bribe to lobotomize Baby Doll. Only after the act is complete does he express remorse, not for destroying her mind, but for underestimating how it robs him of his ability to control her. She won't fight back. It's an extremely dark look into the mind of a rapist misogynist, and Isaac works extraordinarily hard to try and build sympathy for a pathetic worm of a man. I take care of these girls. I look out for them. These are my girls. Tell them. Tell them! Not unreasonably, all of the men in the film are portrayed as varying levels of evil, incompetent, disgusting pigs, with the scant exception of John Hamm's doctor, or high roller in the fantasy. Barely in the film, he is taken aback by Baby Doll's acceptance of her fate. Jesus. Did you... Did you see the way she looked at me? In an extended scene as the high roller, he has a monologue that can be summed up as it's no fun to bang somebody who's not into it, even if you paid for it. It's gross and possessory, and also Baby Doll's fantasy reasoning as to why she would give up. Living as a charming, handsome man's object is preferable to living alone in a mental institution. This is another extremely dark and dangerously misogynistic moment. Given the entire film is the moment between breaths, it begs the question why Baby Doll would fantasize about being a prostitute or have that prostitute fantasize further about being an anime action hero. The film never answers that. It simply leans into the concept of weaponized femininity. Within the institute slash brothel, Baby Doll meets with other prisoners who are willing to join her in her quest for freedom. Abby Cornish as Sweet Pea, her sister Rocket, played by Jenna Malone, Vanessa Hudgens as Blondie, and finally Jamie Chung as Amber. In some simply fantastic action sequences, Snyder misconstrues weaponization for empowerment. All five of the lead actors did extensive weapons and martial arts training, and it shows, especially in an extended scene where Baby Doll, Rocket, and Sweet Pea work seamlessly as a strike team. All of the actors transition seamlessly from one weapon to another and move tactically, showing excellent barrel discipline. For fans of John Wick and Atomic Blonde, these moments are similarly carthetic, though bloodless. The enemies are CG samurai, steampunk Nazi zombies, orcs, or CG robots. Never let it be said that Snyder doesn't wear his influences on his sleeve. Even as a limited consumer of anime, I could recognize the influence on the casting, costuming, and makeup choices. Emily Browning's massive eyes and bone structure are enhanced by makeup and a Sailor Moon-like costume. She achieves through movie magic and genetics what battle angel Alita does with a complete CGI character. In comparison to the absence of the male gaze in Patty Jenkins' Wonder Woman, Sucker Punch struggles under the weight of Snyder's juvenile spank bank of ideas. While each actor is working their ass off in their own roles, they don't have much to do as characters, which is ironically fitting. 
The entire movie is a fantasy. All of the characters have only been part of Baby Doll's life for five days. Her fantasies of them are literally figments of her imagination. Only after the lobotomy is performed do we discover that the goals of the second layer, the map, fire, knife, and a key, and we learn sacrifice, have real-world consequences. The bleed between the real world and the brothel is suddenly motivated because actions in one have consequences in the other. The final scene is a head shaker upon first viewing as exposition and homily spouting Scott Glenn. Remember ladies, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. Arrives for the final time as a bus driver and aids Sweet Pea in her escape. Prior to this moment, he was only in the fantasy sequences. It is only upon reflection looking back to Sweet Pea's narration over the proscenium and her final words at the end of the film do we realize that Baby Doll is imagining someone else's story. The last time she saw Sweet Pea in the real world was when Baby Doll sacrificed herself, allowing Sweet Pea to escape. The lobotomized Baby Doll would have no idea what happened to her as her story ended before the film does. Sweet Pea leaves the audience with the core message Snyder attempts throughout the film, mistaking violence for empowerment. You have all the weapons you need. Now fight. I love Sucker Punch, and now I hope you do too. I was sick for almost the entirety of making this video, and I hope you can tell. Like, share, and subscribe, and there will be no vote for the next two videos, as our next video is going to be Godzilla 1998, and after that, Megaforce. Check us out at Cinematological on Twitter, Instagram, Vimeo, and Facebook, or at Cinematological.com. Eventually, there'll be another poll for you to vote on of a bad movie I love and I want to help you love. Thanks for watching. Go love a bad movie.